it all right. He'll make it all right. He'll make it all right. He'll make it all right. Whatever. Whatever you want. He's listening. He's listening. Whatever you need. Whatever you need. He'll supply. He'll supply. Whatever is broken. Whatever is broken. He can fix it. He can fix it. No need to worry. No need to worry. He's alive. God bless you, by the way. This is our Communion Sunday, and we do want to remember what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did for us on Calvary's cross. We want to serve communion, give communion, and uh, commune together. I trust that you have your elements, and uh, we, we're gonna say a prayer over the elements. Our Father and our God, we thank you. We praise you, God. We thank you for this time and this opportunity. We thank you, God, so much for your son, Jesus, who hung, bled, and died on Calvary's cross to pay the price of our sins, giving his body and his blood or dying for us. God, we want to always remember what you've done for us. So God, we ask that you would change this from a carnal to a spiritual as we remember what he did for us. In Jesus' name, amen. And the word of God tells us that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, they were having the traditional Passover supper, a supper that started back 
when God sent Moses into Egypt to tell the Pharaoh to let my people go. During that time, the Pharaoh was hard-hearted, so God further hardened his heart and allowed plagues to take over Egypt. The last plague was the plague of death, where the firstborn in each family would die when death would come. Israel was told to slay an innocent lamb, take the blood from that lamb, and put that blood over the doorpost and the lentils. And when uh, death would come, death would see the blood and pass over. That innocent lamb then represented the Lamb of God, the true Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. He has come, he has given his body, he has died or shed his blood for us. So now we want to present and move in this memorial, a memorial service remembering what he has done. And as they were having that traditional Passover supper, the Passover supper changed to the Lord's Supper. Now on the scene was the Lamb of God himself. And the Word of God says after they had that supper, he took bread and after giving thanks for the bread, he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat it. Let us partake. And the Word of God says, in the same manner, he took the cup. He said, this is my blood in the New Testament. Drink ye all of it. And as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me, the body and the blood of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. Good morning and grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I greet you in the name of Jesus. I give honor to my Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, for truly he is worthy to be praised. Really, he is really worthy to be praised. I also give honor to my pastor, Pastor Parker, and the man of God that he is. And I thank the Lord for his life and that under him, I've learned how to be a bold and a strong soldier in the Lord. To my peers in the ministry, I give honor to you as well. And I thank God for every remembrance of you. I thank God for all of you today. And I am humbled at the opportunity to be able to share a word of life with you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Lord God, we thank you, O Father, for another day. Another day that you have made, O Lord God. Another day, O Lord God, that we're able to rejoice and be glad, O Lord God. Father God, we thank you, O Lord God, for your loving kindness, O Lord. A loving kindness, O God, that is better than life, O Lord. Now, Lord, as I stand here, O Lord God, I'm asking you to hide me behind the cross, O Lord. Father God, that I would do your will, O Lord. And God, I thank you, O Lord, that your word shall not return void, O God. Father, I pray also, O Lord God, that I know that in you, O Lord God, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, O Lord, that they shall be acceptable in your sight. Lord, I thank you and I praise you in Jesus name. Amen. The scripture reading for today is taken from Matthew's uh, chapter 25 verses 1 through 9. And it reads this way. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise 
took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And verse 10 says, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. And if I also might just share uh, John chapter 19, verse 14. Now, it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said, he, meaning Pontius Pilate, said to the Jews, behold, you're a king. And if I would just have a leave a subject today or a word with you today, it would be preparation H. And that's preparation heaven or preparation hell. Now, I'm going to come back to that scripture, but I, I, I had the privilege of sharing this message a few weeks ago. And the way I originally received it was just a message of preparation. But as I began to dialogue and meditate more about the original message, I received another message from the same message. You see, the word of God is, inex is most certainly inexhaustible. At the end of 2020, I was having this quiet conversation with God in my mind. And my thoughts were of humanity and how humanity prepares for the holidays and how humanity makes elaborate plans to decorate and buy gifts and visit family and do all of these things. How even now in a, a time when we are to practice social distance, some of humanity is still just making preparations to do what they want and how they want and when they want with no concern for anyone else or anything else other than that moment. I was like, God, humanity is pre preparing for everything except for Jesus. Everything except for heaven. As I thought about how humanity prepares, the Lord began to remind me how he, God, the creator and maker of the heavens and the earth, the one who breathed his breath into man and became a living soul. How he made preparation for all of humanity. That preparation was for an abundant life and, the, and an eternal life through his son Jesus. Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. You can't get to God without Jesus. I don't care what anybody tells you that the only way to get through the son to the father is through the son. That's like having rest with no sleep. That's like having a lobster with no butter sauce. You just the, the two just won't work out unless you have one without the other. So the Lord reminded me of John 3 16 where Jesus himself said that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You see, death is something that happens every day. Even though it's expected at some point, death still takes us by surprise. It's the unknown. It's the inevitable. And we are all impacted by it or will be impacted by it at some point. You see, this breath that we breathe will depart from our bodies and there will be a life to, li to live beyond that breath, beyond all the preparations that are being made for this life. See, we don't want to just plan for earthly treasures or investments based solely upon the things of the earth where we know fire can come in and destroy or thieves can come in and steal or even time can often deteriorate. You see, there's this little thing called circumstance. Circumstance can come in and change everything. And I'd rather believe in Christ that when the breath is gone out of this vessel, that we will go to an eternal heaven than to not believe and end up in an eternal hell. I'd rather err on the side of caution. In this preparation for heaven, 
Sometimes I may suffer some things. But nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And I would be remiss not to mention the verse that follows John 3:16. John 3:17, Jesus again said that God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That might be saved part, that might depends on you. If you choose to believe, we each have a free will and nothing is ever forced upon us when it comes to faith in God. It will always be a choice that you make for yourself to believe or not to believe in Jesus Christ. And that saved part, some might ask saved, saved from what? It's about being kept from the deadly and destructive nature of sin and the pain of the guilt or the disparity that one might feel or go through because of those circumstances that I mentioned earlier. Remember, circumstances can come along and destroy some stuff. Circumstance can destroy mentally and circumstance can destroy physically and circumstance can destroy spiritually. Saved. Is that rescue from danger and destruction and evil that would obstruct you from being receptive to the good news of this gospel? You see, even though there is an evil in the world, you can still have peace. Jesus is telling us in John chapter 10, verse 10, that the thief comes not. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and that more abundantly. See, J Jesus came to give you a life with advantage. Advantage over the enemy and advantage over the enemy who is the thief that he's talking about here. See, the thief, that thief can be of anger. That thief can be a thief of depression. That thief that comes with the weight of emotional scars that could lead one to substance abuse. Thief of false teachers that would feed your emotions and satisfy your flesh and leave you spiritually empty. And young people, I want you to know that that thief is also weed, which is a false teacher. It clouds your mind and gives you a false perception or assessment of things. A temporary continuous setback so the enemy can come in and think you make you think that that weed is clearing your mind, but it's not clearing your mind. It's, it's giving you a false perception of what the reality of your situation is. And I just want to tell you that if you want the reality of a situation, then try Jesus. Sometimes he's going to cause you to deal with your truth. And sometimes before the truth sets you free, it's going to hurt. That false reality will cause you to ch exchange the truth of God for a lie. Jesus said, I come. I come that you might have life and that more abundantly. And as I was in this conversation with God, these scriptures began to come and come to me. Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth his love towards us. That means that he put his love in action towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. None of us were an afterthought. God didn't wait for us to finish our sin. But while we were yet sinners, he sent his son to die for our sins, that we would have the opportunity to the right to the tree of life. Now, see, in the beginning, there were two trees in the garden, and a lot of us always focus on the tree that Adam and Eve ate from, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but there was a tree of life there. And that tree of life is Jesus. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, the Lord has made preparation for us even at the creation. You see, in all of his creation, he prepared everything to be fruitful and multiply. He even spoke to the animals to be fruitful and multiply. Plants and vegetation, his preparation, seeded itself. 
his preparation. You can take one apple and one apple has many seeds and you can take that seed and plant it in the ground which will produce an apple tree and from that one seed one tree and many apples and so that's God's preparation for humanity he left nothing out his preparation was even at the fall of man the disobedience of man at that tree of the knowledge of good and evil there he was making provision. And that provision was Jesus. God made a preparation of salvation. For even now we know that Jesus is already gone to prepare a place for us. The Lord has prepared us at, for every time, at every season and in every season. But are we prepared? Are we prepared to live this life on earth and experience life? of peace on our earth and are we prepared for life after this life are we prepared for heaven or are we prepared for hell now back to the scripture preparation is something that takes place before an event luke chapter 23 verse 54 reads that that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. And I know it's only part of a scripture, but I just want to show you that preparation is an event that takes place before another event. Mark 15, chapter 15, verse 42 reads, Now when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath. I remember when I was a little girl that Sunday was a sacred day and whatever was going on had to be done by Sunday. On Saturday, everything had to be done. The laundry, the cleaning of the house, the, the grocery shopping and how we had to get our hair washed and pressed with that hot comb. And, and, and now I remember that Saturday was even a, a day of preparation for Sunday dinner. And then when Sunday came, Sunday was truly a day of worship and, and family rest. We don't have those times anymore. We're living in a time of COVID where people are perishing and dying left and right. And I don't care what your race is, but this COVID is affecting everybody. We're living in a time where young people are, are dying at a rapid rate. They're, they're killing one another and people are robbing one another. But the word of God speaks of how we're living in the last days. John chapter 19 verse 14 says, Now it was the preparation day of the Passover. And about the sixth hour, Pontius Pilate said to the Jews, behold your king. You see, one day we shall all see him. One day, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. You see, the wages of sin is still death. And the gift of God is still eternal life. And God is still doing what God does. But what are you prepared for? Are you prepared for heaven or are you prepared for hell? And so here we go back to the text, Matthew 25, which is about spiritual readiness. In the text, we read that there were 10 virgins and five were foolish and five were wise. They all had lamps. They all had oil in their lamps. All were waiting on the bridegroom and all slumbered and slept and all rose when the bridegroom came and trimmed or decorated their lamps. But all were not adequately prepared. Some had only made preparation for that moment. And some for more than that moment. Who can remember a moment when something happened and you said, whew, I wasn't prepared for that. Or whew. I could have lost my life. That was the worst moment of my life. But the Lord brought you through those worst moments. The Lord spared your life yet again. And then guess what? You had other worst moments. And he brought you through that too. It was in those worst moments that you either learned to trust in Jesus or you went back to the thing that would cause more trouble, more worst moments. 
In the Old Testament, the, the generations, they talked about the, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And if we want to relay it to right now for those worst moments that we go through, I, I, I looked at the God of my mama and the God of my grandmother and the God of my aunt Lila to, to bring me through those worst moments. You see, I would hear them say that the Lord is my light and my salvation. That is the God of my help, my deliverance, my rescue, my safety. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? You see, in these worst moments, one would learn that God can prepare you for every moment. Sometimes we're in, we're, we're, we're in those worst moments and we become fearful as you might be a babe in Christ or you might not even know, even not even in Christ and have those worst moments. But in learning the God that I learned about when I was a little girl, that God of my mother, the one that I know personally now. It was in my worst moments that I learned how to strip myself of who I was and come to a place in Jesus Christ and, and, and totally learn how to trust him. And somebody asked me, how did you get to that place? But I stand here to tell you now that there were times that I had to carry my little old self to the foot of the cross many times on many occasions. And sometimes that foot of the cross was while I was sitting in my car. Sometimes the foot of the cross was while I was in the bathroom on the floor just crying out to Jesus. Sometimes the foot of that cross was laying in the bed next to my husband and silently weeping, Lord, I need you to help me. That was in those worst moments. But every time I got up, God gave me strength. Every time I got up, Jesus heard me. I could hear him presenting me faultless before the throne of God. Every time. And so I just want to tell you that no matter how many worst moments that you have, just go, just continue to go to the foot of the cross and Jesus will meet you there. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. The text says, and at midnight. Midnight represents a sudden change. The bridegroom came. A transition took place. And we not only have to be prepared for the transitions of life, but we also should be prepared for the transition from life. We learn from the verse that the foolish had no additional oil and no vessel and asked the wise virgins to give them their oil. But the wise said no. They made adequate preparations. They not only had oil in their lamps, but they had oil in their vessels also. The wise had adequate preparation. They had to tell the, the foolish virgins to, to go to the people that sell oil and, and buy oil from them. But in the meantime, those that had the oil, that they were able to go in to the presence with the bridegroom. Lack of preparation on your part does not create an emergency for Jesus. See, Jesus already handled the emergency. He handled the emergency when he died on the cross for the sins of the world. Jesus was the first responder. Are you prepared? Have you been so busy going to church that you have missed the message? Have we missed the opportunity as the church to tell some foolish people that, yeah, I, I, I get it that you got this lamp. I, I, I get that you got this jo job. I, I get that you got this career. I, I get that you got these friends and I get that you got this money and I get that you got this title. But but do you have Jesus? Do you have peace? And are you prepared beyond this moment, beyond this time? How about when circumstance hit? How about when the oil runs out of this lamp called life? Did you make preparation? Have you made preparations? Are you prepared for heaven or are you prepared for hell? When this life is over, there'll be no more time for asking or begging. Get what you need right now. 
have you missed the message of love? Or have you missed as a church giving the message of love? That when someone is suffering from a broken heart, to let them know that there is a, a higher caliber of love, a love that won't leave you broken hearted. A love that superseded and still supersedes human definition. Not that I love you but, but the one that says I love you in spite of. This agape love, this love of God that is patient and, and kind, a, a love that doesn't envy and a love that not proud or rude, a love that keeps no record of wrongs. A love that never fails and a, a love that preserves you and prepares you and enables you to continue to go to the foot of the cross. Where Jesus will never turn you away. Where he'll never look at you where you are, but he'll look beyond your faults and he'll supply you with all of your needs. Yes, this, this life comes with trouble. And yet again, as a matter of fact, Jesus said again, this is Jesus talking to us, the one who came to die for the sins of the world, the one who came for, for me, the one who came for you. He said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I give you the truth that I know today. As I heard it said a few weeks ago, I don't have any gimmicks to draw anybody to Jesus. I heard that preached and that thing was a blessing to my soul. Because the church can't use gimmicks to draw people to Jesus. Then if we use the gimmicks to draw people, we'll have to use the same gimmicks to keep them. And see, the Holy Spirit is enough to draw them and keep them. The word of God says that God sent his word and it healed them. And so that tells me that the word travels. So as a church... We shouldn't be trying any gimmicks, but the world should know us by our love. The world should know us by the fruits of our spirit, by the fruits of the spirit. And my truth is, before I, I, I depart from this place, is that the best way for me to describe what, what happened to me, how I had to get to that place of preparation for heaven or for hell, is, is I think about in, in Ezekiel chapter 16, when the Lord was talking to the prophet Ezekiel about people that had belonged to him, the children of Israel. And I took this from that because it so perfectly described where I was. That there was a time when I was struggling in my own blood, struggling in my sin of adultery and struggling in my lies. There was a time I was struggling in my drinking and struggling in my emptiness and struggling with my suicidal thoughts. I was struggling with the inadequacy and my emotional scars both directly and indirectly reflected upon me. Some of this, I was struggling with my own blood even while I was saved. But the Lord looked down upon me and, and said, live. And the only way I could live was to accept Jesus. The only way that I could live or make it from day to day was to, to surrender all. You know, this old song says that I surrender all. All to Jesus. I truly give. You see, I had to confess. But let me tell you something that confession is easy. See, confession is with the mouth. And even as a Christian, we still have to confess. We have to confess wrongs because none of us are perfect. All have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. I fall short every day. But see, repentance. Repentance is within the heart. And even now and as a Christian, I, I'm just keeping it real that I still have to repent. Christians aren't perfect. We're, we're just forgiven and we have a good support system. But what the Lord did in my life was in Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 8 and 9. What he did was the scripture reads this way. When I passed by you again and saw you, behold, 
You were at the age for love. That means that I had matured. That I had let some things go, some excess baggage. I, I began to lay aside some weight in the, in the sin that so easily beset me. And then he said, and I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered you with nakedness. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord, and you became mine. So just as I am his, that you can become his. And it doesn't matter what you've done or, or how you've done it or how many times you've been there, that the Lord will come in and he will cover you. Then I bathed you with water and washed off your blood from you and anointed you with oil. When I thought I was unworthy, when I thought I was unfit, God came in. And some of you might be saying that that's Old Testament, but the word of God is true. The New Testament confirms the Old Testament. And just let me tell you that God is most certainly still doing what he does. The blood of Jesus still saves. You see, in Hebrews, I, I, I read that to the uttermost that Jesus saves. So it doesn't matter where you've been. It, it doesn't matter what happened or, or how many times it happened. And it doesn't matter what you think. But there is redemption through the blood of Jesus. In New Testament scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new cre creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So I just want to keep it real with you. I asked a question the other day about I don't understand why Christians think that being a Christian, you we won't have trouble because trouble comes. I, and I'm not going to keep that from you because, as I said earlier, Jesus said it himself. But see, this is what I have come to know, that I have this treasure in this earthen vessel in Christ. That the excellency of the power of God. Is in me, not because of me, but because of God in me. And so sometimes we're hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but in this, not in despair and persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. And see in me preparing to decide what life I wanted to live, that I wanted to live a life inside of Christ. I'm prepared for heaven. I'm not looking as people say, oh, when we get to hell, we're going to have a party. No. I'm looking to go to heaven. You see, because when I understand it, that hell is a, an eternal torment that you're walking around, could be scratching your head, trying to figure out how would you mess up and how did you get here? But God doesn't desire that for you. He doesn't desire for any man to die in his sin. And so right now, today, at this moment, I, I, I just implore you. No, you're not going to understand everything. But just come to Jesus right now. God wants you prepared for a life after this life. And he's not trying to restrict you because I live a life that's full of joy and I have the peace of God. That scripture that describes Jesus that sometimes we only use at, at Christmas time or, or during the holidays that he is a wonderful counselor, mighty God, prince of peace. No, I experience that with Jesus every day. And so I'm, all I'm asking you is to just try him and see. And you don't have to follow after man, but when you find somebody that's rooted and grounded in Jesus, they can lead you to Christ. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, I bless your name, O Lord God. And God, I thank you, O Father, for this appointed time. God, I thank you, O Lord God, that your word shall do what you have sent it to do. And so, God, I thank you. Lord, I bless your name.
God, I thank you, oh Lord God, for the one, oh Lord God, who will be bold enough at this time, oh God, to examine themselves and to keep it real with you, oh Lord. God, I pray that they would know, oh Lord God, that in your presence there is fullness of joy. God, I pray, oh Lord God, that they would know, oh Lord God, that most certainly in Jesus Christ, oh Lord God, that there is no more condemnation to them that are in him, oh God. And God, I pray, oh Lord God, that they would come to know, oh Lord God, you, Lord, in the pardon of their sins, in the midst of their hurt, in the midst of their disappointment, and in the midst of their anger, oh Lord. Father God, I pray, oh Lord God, that for them today, oh Lord God, at this very moment, that old things would be passed away and all things would become new. I know that sometimes it's a little um, scary and you don't really know, but you don't have to go to Jesus with all these, oh, these and thous and thuses. You can just keep it real with him. Lord, I had it wrong. God, I didn't have enough information. Or oh, Lord, I've been struggling with this thing from day to day. And God, I'm just ready to let it go. And so, Lord, I surrender my all to you. Lord, I ask that you would come into my heart and forgive me for my sins. And Lord, strengthen me day by day. Lord, teach me and guide me to do your will. Lord, that I can have a life of freedom and be prepared for heaven. Amen.